Mr. Roberts, if I could come to you first of all and begin with um, perhaps a bit of a cliche. In the in the overview of your annual report, you say the Isle of Man's position as the safest jurisdiction in the British Isles has been reinforced. Um, we know government's mantra that the Isle of Man is a is a safe place to live and work. Um, and with increases in violent crime, more drugs coming to the island than ever before, and police arrests up by nearly a fifth, is that position at the top of the sort of safety pedestal, if you like, under any threat, do you think? I don't think it's under any threat, uh, but the pattern of offending is changing. So it's, it's a su- supremely safe place. You know, if, if you just measure on crime levels alone, uh, we're four times safer than England and Wales now. But that, that that's... That's a side issue, really. It, it, it's, it's about how safe people feel. So if you look at the government survey that's done every year, 90-odd percent, nine, as high as 98% of people feel safe. So it is a safe place. But the fundamentals of the drugs market are such that there's a lot of money to be made, and drugs brings crime, and it brings violent crime, and that's what we have to be very alert to. How, how are those um, safety levels measured in comparison with other, other jurisdictions first? I know you said it's a, a sideline, but just yes, out of interest. Well, in, ter- in terms of crime, we use a thing uh, that's the UK National Crime Recording Standard. We've used it here since 2001. Um, the Channel Islands have recently gone on to use it. Guernsey went on to it in the last 12 months. And so we, we have a an ability to draw direct comparisons there on, on in terms of what we record. But crime amounts only to about a third of what we do as a police service. Um, do, do those comparisons matter? Do we... I, I think they matter in terms of it's important to benchmark, so it's important to know, particularly measuring ourselves against the Channel Islands, what's happening there. So um, acquisitive crime is low on the island. Drugs now account for 18% of all the crime that happens here. Um, violent crime is half of what it was a decade ago, but it's starting to creep up. So it's important in, in, in those terms to know what's happening elsewhere so that we can um, have a sense of what's happening and we can deal with things properly here. So how, how much of your job is spent monitoring what we might call national trends or trends with other jurisdictions? Um, a well-publicised example recently might be a, a dramatic increase in knife crime in London, of course. Um, or perhaps is your outlook more introverted, would you say? No, I think you have to do both. So I think, I think sometimes things that happen in the UK can happen here a few years after the event. What we're seeing, I think, in places like London is... Uh, a reduction in police numbers, a significant reduction in police numbers. Uh, police officers are afraid to use their stop and search powers, probably for political reasons, and a withdrawal of support services, so mentoring schemes that stop young people getting into trouble, um, social workers, youth workers, all the things that go around supporting young people have disappeared from places like London. Consequences are increased violence, increased knife crime, there's, there's no neighbourhood policing, and uh, we see that very sadly that people people are losing their lives. So it's very important here to be alert to that. But clearly, what the environment's entirely different. The, the the knife crime is an extreme example, of course. But do we see trends from elsewhere um, sort of filter into the island? Maybe is, is is that a theme? We can, and I think media and social media have a part to play in that, so that young people will see things happening elsewhere and think that's okay. And um, Two years ago, we had a we had a significant increase in the number of uh, knives being carried. We we had a doubling in the number in in a, in a year. Uh, it's been about the same over the last twelve months. But um, it, since the first of April, we've had two offences where knives have been used to to harm people. So we have to be uh, really alive to that, and we have to do lots of work at a very early age to educate young people to make sure that they they understand the dangers and they understand that they shouldn't be doing it. So does that come into neighbourhood policing? I made mention there of neighbourhood policing in the UK. Neighbourhood policing in the UK has, has gone and it's now, uh, constabularies are trying to rebuild it. We've had a big reduction um, and that came when our budget step was first cut in 2008. Um, we're now in the course of rebuilding it and in October we'll sh- restructure a bit so that we have dedicated teams of neighbourhood officers who, who, who don't stand on uh, uh, dealing with road traffic collisions, who, who are not stuck in the cell block for hours on end interviewing people, who do purely neighbourhood work and it's, it's an important change for us. You've mentioned about budgetary changes and about um, funding. Perhaps it would be a good time to come on to the, the 2019 budget, um, an important one for the constabulary, of course. Um, to bring you in here, Minister, if I could, um, you both welcomed the £3 million increase in funding from Treasury this year, uh, the majority of which was essentially ring-fenced, am I right, to the constabulary. Um, the headline statistic was that it was the first real-terms increase in police funding since 2001. Um in your opinion, Minister, has has that injection marked the end of austerity in the force, perhaps? 
Well, I like to think so. Um, when, I, when I took over as minister, I didn't have a budget. There was nothing There was nothing I could spend any money on because it, we'd done nothing but cut, cut, cut. Um, and you've heard the Chief Constable saying that there's been a reduction in police officers, which has not obviously helped. Um, I have to fight very hard within um, council and with treasury um, to, to put the case forward that there was not just money we needed to increase the police officers, but there was back pay and other things that had to be uh, accounted for as well. So um, I think this year, with the extra officers we're getting, we're going to see quite a difference. I think you've heard the Chief Constable is going to have new officers coming in the, on the um, road safety, on the drug side of it, on neighbourhood policing. This is all going to help going forward. I'm, I mean, I keep saying I'm not finished yet within my department because I have probation issues because rehabilitation to me is a really big part of, of keeping people back out of jail again, keeping them back out of the police station again. And we can only do the rehabilitation with the correct amount of probation officers and, uh, and working with the prison and with the police to reduce that. You've perhaps partly answered this already, but that £3 million, um, give us a bit of a breakdown about where that's been allocated. If you could. Probably the Chief Constable will probably have the more of the breakdown. I mean, I know the percentages on the there was a backlog of pay increases over the last two years, which we had to, to we've tried to to uh, absorb, which was totally impossible. So we, that that was had to go back to treasury. So we employ more, or we're going to employ more officers in the course of recruiting more. So we 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 got down uh, to just under two hundred and ten officers at our height. We were at two hundred and forty eight. We'll get up to two hundred and twenty nine or two hundred and thirty. That's about where we're aiming for. Um, so some of it's going on extra officers, and they'll go into neighbourhoods. They'll go into drug trafficking work, they'll go into road safety, they'll go into in the investigation of, of um, sexual offences. All the things that over recent years have, have caused us problems. A, a big chunk of the money will go into uh, improvements in IT, in economic crime, um, so that we can con continue to show the progress that we're making in terms of effectiveness and when we get scrutiny from outside we can, we can show what we've done. And there's a significant chunk as well gone into training, so our training budget got as low as 46,000 uh, per year, which for for us is, was wholly inadequate, so that's uh, gone back up to about 300,000. So it's not it's not just in people, it's, it's in some of the infrastructure things as well. Um, Minister, you would you would obviously always welcome more funding, I'm sure, oh, um, yes. as, as most political representatives would, but um, hopefully this is a step in the right direction in your eyes, would you feel? Uh, most definitely. I think this year we, are, we started to move forward. Um, I'm very pleased with how the Chief Constable is, is approaching this. I, I do the policy side of it and we make sure he's got the legislation and the powers, but how he manages that within his own force is entirely up to Chief Constable. Um, you said after the budget announcement that this had taken um, a huge amount of work over a number of years um, from your department and, and from you yourself, or, or words to that effect. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the, the sort of negotiation process behind trying to ask for, for more funding? Well, we all have to put budget bids in. I mean, and my department hadn't put any budget bids in for something like eight years, I think, or, or, even, or even longer. Um, they were, you know, we, I took over as a, as a minister, as a, as a businessman, from uh, an ex-bank manager, an ex-accountant, um, and before that there was a, an ex-bank uh, manager. So I had two ministers before me who were really were cutting the budget because of the times, and it had to be done. Um, but as I said earlier on, it left me virtually with no, no wriggle room whatsoever. So I had to to put the case forward that, you know, if you're going to see, if crime's going to increase and we haven't got enough officers, we need some money, more money, more officers, and that can only be done with more funding. And I'm glad to say that, you know, within the council and within Treasury, they, they realised this. And uh, I was extremely lucky this year that we got what we're looking for. Mr Roberts, from, from your point of view, um, following the budget announcement, you, you told Manx Radio that cuts to policing would, would have consequences and uh, cracks which you predicted during your tenure um how long will they now take to heal do you think i think over a couple of years we'll start to see progress again and the force has published a new strategic plan and the new strategic plan is about prevention so prevention goes arm in arm with uh, neighborhood policing if we get the prevention right then we will reduce crime and we'll make people f even safer than they are where, what's important, I think, though, is that uh, it's not just about the police. So, for example, tomorrow my, my senior team are spending the afternoon with the Public Health Directorate because we're looking at where we can work closely together on long-term strategic planning to reduce things. Mm -hmm. So uh, in places like Scotland, they've taken a public health approach to violent crime and they've reduced violent crime considerably, and that's what we intend to do here on the island. I th sorry, I, th I think it's worth mentioning that although we see in certain areas we, we see sort of 
crime creeping up and, and violence, etc. But I put a lot of that down to the fact that the public have more faith in the police these days, that they they will talk to the police, they will report crime much more freely now than what they used to be able to report crime. So um, I certainly, talking to the chief over the last year or two, certainly with maybe Eastern Europeans where they, they, they weren't um, reporting some of the crimes and the, and the violence, are becoming more amenable to the police and they're becoming more cooperative. Um, and obviously the more that they reported, obviously the more that the, the figures will actually go up. That's, that's, that's confidence in the police. So do you think there's been a, a shift in culture, perhaps? I think what's important to note is on things like sexual offending, where in the past, when I talked 30, 40 years ago, the culture wasn't to report it and it wasn't for the police to investigate it. I spent some time at Christmas with a, a man who'd been enormously damaged by abuse that he'd had when he was a child, and he tried to report it and he was... Um, according to him quite brutally treated and it, it went nowhere people now report these things and that and, and we've had a big growth over the last two or three years in reports of non-recent sexual abuse cases and that people report that when they feel that the police will do something about it yeah.